Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Kyle Cotterwick, and I'm here to talk to you about system design lessons that we can learn from the golden age of space flight, the space race. A bit about me uh, before we launch into things. I did my PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I specialized in aerospace and um, aeronautics and astronautics, so aircraft and spacecraft. Uh, particularly in the human uh, systems integration domain, so how we develop systems that humans can work with so that they are safe and they work effectively and don't break the systems or break themselves. After I finished that, I moved to Ottawa, Ontario, which is the national capital of Canada, uh, where I started my own company, Invictin Labs, and we specialize in a lot of uh, cloud systems, cloud integration, and are currently working on a number of projects for the uh, Canadian Department of National Defense. So we'll get into this by doing a review of the space race in five minutes. A space race, of course, between the US and between the Soviet Union uh, following World War II. So 1945, the Allies defeat the Nazis in World War II, victory in Europe. And as part of this victory, they started what they called Operation Paperclip, which is where they took a bunch of Nazi scientists and brought them to the US to work for America. There was one particular Nazi. His name was Dr. Werner von Braun. And he was most well-known, we can see him here with a bunch of his SS colleagues, uh, he was most well-known for developing the V2 rocket. And any German folks here can com correct my pronunciation, but some not-so-fun facts about the V2. V stands for Vergeltungswaffen, uh, which means vengeance weapon, and these things killed 9,000 civilians in World War II in Allied countries, and 12,000 people died making them in labor camps. So, Dr. Von Braun, interesting fellow. But America says, hey, rockets seem cool. We want some rockets. We're willing to overlook your transgressions and bring you to the US to work for us. So they bring him to America, and he launches the American rocket program and leads its development. And we can see him here with some very famous people, JFK on the right, Dr. Von Braun in the middle, and uh, Robert Siemens on the left here, who was the deputy director of NASA. So the space race kicks off by the Soviets launching their Sputnik rocket with their Sputnik satellite. Uh, October 4th, 1957, first artificial satellite in Earth orbit, right? And this is really the first major milestone in the space race. And they follow this up by launching some more things into space. This is Leica, 
uh, first animal to be launched into orbit, and they wanted to demonstrate that living things could actually survive a launch and survive in space. Unfortunately, this one did not survive the re-entry. The US develops the Redstone rocket uh, to start launching their own things into space. They start with Explorer 1, which is the first American satellite in orbit, and then they follow up by launching some of their own animals. This is Ms. Baker, uh, who launched with her colleague on one of these rockets and was the first American animal in orbit. And then the next big thing happens. Yuri Gagarin is launched into orbit, the first person to orbit the Earth, April 12th, 1961. And this is probably the defining moment in the space race where uh, the Americans realized how far behind they were and how advanced the Soviets were in comparison, and things really went into overdrive. So JFK makes his famous speech in 1962 at Rice University, saying, we will go to the moon by the end of this decade. I can't do a JFK accent, but that's basically what he said. And this really motivates uh, the public, the scientists, NASA, to get this thing done. And they dump an insane amount of money into it. And so they start making substantial progress themselves. They start developing some new capsules. They have the Mercury capsule here on the left. They develop new rockets. This is the Atlas D. And they start launching some of their own people into space. The Soviets developed the Voskhod rocket, which they used to launch a number of their follow-on missions. The Americans developed the Titan II for the Gemini program. Gemini was a series of missions that was designed to uh, test skills and equipment that would be needed for the Apollo program in space, such as spacewalking and rendezvous and docking of multiple spacecraft. The Soviets developed the N1, which was a massive and fascinating rocket and would have been great if it hadn't have blown up spectacularly many times. Uh, eventually, they gave up and stopped trying to launch it, and the Americans developed the Saturn V, which was the definitive rocket of this era that really pushed them over the line in terms of the space race. And this all culminated in the conclusion of the race with Apollo 11, July 20th, 1969, humans setting foot on the moon for the first time. And this kind of summarizes the race, but, which is interesting in itself, but what's really fascinating here is the time scale. In 25 years, from 1944 to 1969, we went from a V-2 rocket that could barely cross the English Channel to landing and walking on the moon. And 25 years, that is unparalleled in terms of technological advancements. And to really hammer that home, we can compare with some modern um, alternatives. SLS, the Space Launch System. This is a rocket that has been in development for 12 years so far. It's going to be another year and a half at least before people get launched on this thing. So that's 14 years of development to get a person off the ground on this rocket. And that's NASA. Virgin Galactic took 19 years to get their suborbital craft or, um, into a suborbital flight and start doing commercial flights. Blue Origin took 23 years they've been in operation, and only recently they start, started doing any operational flights. And there's a pretty good reason for this, right? We have to give them some credit, because NASA had a little more to work with. Uh, they were dealing with a budget of 4.5% of the U.S. federal budget uh, compared to about half a percent now. So they had nine times the amount of funding as they do now, which is, of course, a very good reason to drive such quick advancement. But the other key factor at play was the modernization from analog and mechanical to digital. And we can see that very rapidly from a Mercury capsule in 1961, where everything is mechanically linked. You can see all the controls are actual mechanical linkages to actuators and valves, versus the lunar excursion module eight years later, which landed on the moon in an entirely fly-by-wire mode. Right? These, all these controls are connected to a computer, which then actually runs the systems. And that explains a lot of the other part of the advancement. But we also have some key people to thank for this. Uh, Margaret Hamilton is one we always have to note. Uh, she was the first programmer who was hired for the Apollo program. And in 1965, she became the director of the Software Engineering Division. And she worked on this thing, which is the Apollo Guidance Computer, the other key piece of technology in terms of software and hardware development. So on the left here, we actually see the computer itself. And on the right is what's called the DISCI, the Display and Keyboard Unit, which was quite an innovation for its time. And one of the reasons that this thing was uh, such an advancement was this beautiful thing. This is called core rope memory. This is a read-only memory where you literally write your software into it by sewing copper wires through different loops. And this thing was an, a great advancement over the alternative at the time, which was magnetic core memory, because it had 18 times the energy density. And even at 18 times, it was still 2.5 megabytes per meter cubed. Uh, which is, of course, hilarious by today's standards. But at the time, it was a major advancement. 
And this stuff was pretty labor intensive to make. They actually sewed it by hand in factories following a schematic that corresponded to the software. And it got the nickname LOL Memory, short for Little Old Lady, because to build this, they needed people who were skilled at sewing, and that just happened to be the demographic at the time. So they hired a bunch of elderly women to come work in these factories and create this, um, these computer cores. So after the space race, well, kind of during and later, the Soviets developed the Soyuz rocket and capsule, and the Americans developed their space shuttle, and then very quickly after, this similar-looking Buran shuttle comes along. I wonder where they got that idea. Uh, the Soviets built this thing. This actually launched once in 1988 successfully before they retired it because the Soviet Union kind of fell apart. But it has the distinction of making the first uncrewed flight with a fully autonomous landing to orbit, which is quite an impressive milestone, especially for the very first time they flew it. And since then, the Americans have started building the SLS to replace the space shuttle because it was retired in 2011. And that's where we are today, with, of course, a bunch of commercial providers as well. And that really summarizes the space race and the programs of the different countries kind of up until this point. Now, whenever we talk about aerospace, we have to keep in mind Murphy's Law. And this is something that I think most people have heard of, that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And this actually came from aerospace development. This term was coined by Edward Murphy, Jr., who was a pilot in World War II, and then he worked as an engineer on rocket sleds for the US Air Force. And if you're curious what a rocket sled is, it is literally a sled that slides on rails and has a bunch of rockets strapped to the back. Uh, this thing has 12 solid motor rockets on the back of it. And these were developed to reach very high accelerations and speeds and decelerations to test human response and the performance of various pieces of equipment at those accelerations and speeds. The increased knowledge led to expanded research efforts. Air Force sleds raced at speeds never before achieved to learn more about man's reactions to the conditions <laughs> He's not scared at all. he may find at the edge of space and beyond. When this thing hit the water at the end there, it reached negative 42 Gs of deceleration. That had some very interesting effects on the human body. There were a lot of eyes popping out. But this research, as ridiculous as it looks, was actually instrumental in understanding how humans would react to the high G-forces experienced during launch and various uh, space operations. Now, the, and if you're curious, the reason that this thing is a sled instead of having wheels is because those wheels would spin so fast that they would throw themselves apart from the centrifugal, centrifugal force. So instead, they just have to slide metal on metal. Now, Murphy was brought in after one of these tests that had failed. Uh, they had been unable to collect any data from the test that they were expecting. So they bring Murphy in and say, what happened? And he figures out that some, one of the technicians had installed a bunch of the sensors backwards. And according to his son, uh, what he said at the time was, if there's more than one way to do a job, and one of those ways will result in disaster, then somebody will do it that way. But what the, some of the other engineers who were present at the time said, he said, was, if that guy, referring to that particular technician, has any way of making a mistake, he will. And those phrases were not really, no one really knows exactly what he said, but it was kind of morphed into, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. But according to Murphy himself, what he really meant to say was that humans will make mistakes. And we're going to get a bit more into that. So our first flight that we're going to look at is Apollo 8, December of 1968. And their mission is to make the first flight around the moon in preparation for the follow-on missions that would further descend to and then land on the moon. So we start again with Margaret here, uh, who is key in many of these programs. She was working on the software for, these, uh, for this space flight. And she had a daughter. Her daughter's name was Lauren. And Lauren would come to the lab and stay there and hang out and sleep on the floor while Margaret was working on the code. And one of these times, Lauren was playing in MIT's simulator, computer simulator for this flight that Margaret used to test her code. And while she was playing, she managed to push a sequence of buttons that crashed the simulator entirely. It wiped it out, shut it down, and it had to be reset. And what she found was that uh, Lauren had entered a program that was only supposed to be used during the pre-launch phase. And she had done it while the simulator was in mid-flight between Earth and the Moon. Now, Margaret says, well, that should never happen, so I would like to add some code in that software that will prevent the astronauts from starting programs they shouldn't be running. 
And NASA said, no. No, it is too expensive. It's going to take too long. And you have to keep in mind that changing the code on these things involves re-sewing all of those copper wires. It is not a quick push. Uh, so they said no. Because astronauts are perfect. Astronauts don't make mistakes. They are trained to the point where that could never happen. That's a little foreshadowing right there. So Apollo 8, we have the crew, uh, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. Jim Lovell's a name you'll hear a couple times tonight. And they're launched up. That all goes great. And they're on their way from Earth to the moon. And while they're on their way, Jim here manages to enter program P01 into the computer, the same program that Lauren had entered that she wasn't supposed to. And it wiped everything out of the computer. All of the navigational data that it had been tracking, everything it was using to try to return them back to the Earth, gone. And they had to spend eight hours trying to get that data over the radio from Houston and then enter it manually into the computer. And it, it worked. They survived. They were fine. But they spent eight hours of a mission that was already jam-packed with other objectives doing this to fix this minor error. After this, they told Margaret, yes, you can put that software in the code now. And this brings us to lesson one, which is humans make mistakes, as Murphy said. It doesn't matter how you train them or what kind of technology or equipment you give them. They're eventually going to screw something up. And that could break something. It could kill someone. It could ruin a multi-billion dollar space flight. And this is, if you've been to other NDC conferences, you may have seen another talk that I give about the Boeing 737 MAX, which really dives deeply into this specific topic and how you develop, and how, things you have to consider when you're developing systems that humans use. Um, that's on YouTube if you're curious. But it really gets into the detail about how decisions that were made by Boeing, about how humans would react in certain situations, led to the crash of two of those aircraft and the deaths of hundreds of people. But there's a flip side to that lesson. And for that, we look at Apollo 13, 1970. Now, you may have seen the movie about this with that guy in it. There was an issue. On their way from Earth to the moon, uh, in the oxygen tanks, they were stirring the tanks to keep the oxygen from separating into layers. This is very cold. This is a normal thing to do. But one of the wires in there, the insulation was damaged, and it caused a spark, which ignited the oxygen in the surrounding materials and caused an explosion that ruptured both oxygen tanks and blew all the oxygen out into space. That's kind of a problem when you're on your way to the moon. That, there wasn't much you could do about that. That's a hardware failure that I mean, is going to cause an explosion no matter how it happens. But it's more about the survival story and how they got around that. They used the lunar module as a lifeboat of sorts to keep them alive using its life support systems. And instead of going down to the lunar surface as planned, they simply looped around the moon and came back to Earth using those lunar modules' life support systems. And to do this, it required some very creative engineering. Because the uh, sorry, carbon dioxide scrubber modules that would usually be used for the command module didn't fit in the, or they were not compatible with the scrubbing system for the lunar module. So they had to build this weird adapter uh, that allowed them to use those cartridges with the other system. And this took many hours of, of creative thinking by people on the ground and the astronauts to try to come up with some system that would work to make this happen. Uh, but they did, and it succeeded. And they returned back to Earth without any major issues. And this is that kind of opposite side of that lesson. And that's that humans can fix things. You can build the most complex, thoroughly tested, fully autonomous system you want. But at some point, it's going to encounter a scenario that wasn't expected or something that's going to catastrophically fail, and it will not be able to recover itself. And that is a point where humans come in very handy to have around. And this gives us uh, a decision we have to make about what we call levels of automation. And there are many different levels and different scales that you'll find in different publications, but I've distilled it down to what I think are the core five levels. The first one being no automation at all. The second level being a system that provides helpful information to you, like a navigational system on your phone. It helps you do what you're trying to do, but doesn't actually do anything for you. Level three is something that does automatic control when the human directs it to, right? Like the cruise control in your car. You turn it on, it automates. You turn it off, it stops. Level four is automation unless you stop it from being automated. Windows Update is a great example. It will update itself and interrupt all of your work unless you manually intervene and tell it, not right now. And then level five is automatic control with no human override. And that's a pretty rare thing to find on Earth here, because most systems have some big red emergency stop button you can press that will shut it down. 
But we see this sometimes in remote spacecraft that are autonomous, such as the New Horizons probe that photographed uh, Pluto, because that latency is so high that there's no way a human can do anything by the time it's too late. And so there we see some fully autonomous systems. And choosing the right level of automation for your platform or your overall architecture is a very tricky question. And, and we see that a lot, with particularly in the self-driving car field these days, uh, of all these companies struggling to really determine what is the appropriate level of automation. And now we're going to look a little bit more at software specifically. And for this, we talk about Apollo 11, that flight that was the first to land on the moon, June 20, sorry, July 20th, 1969. So we have our intrepid crew of explorers, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. Uh, Collins stayed in the command module while the other two descended to the surface. And their mission, of course, was to land on the moon. And here we have a shot of them departing from the command module and on their way down to the lunar surface, taken from the command module. Now, during their descent, they encountered a couple issues. They train exhaustively and go through all the different possible scenarios and errors that could occur during descent, different hardware failures. And they know by heart most of the different errors that can happen and what that means, whether they can continue or have to take some specific action or whether they have to abort and go back up. But during descent, they came across an error that they had never heard before. This is, this is actual footage. Looking good to us, over. 1202. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. So you can see from this that this alarm occurs, and they don't recognize it. They're asking ground control, what is this, and can we keep going, or do we have to abort? And you'll note that that alarm actually happens quite a few times. That and a similar 1201 alarm occur five different times during that landing sequence. And that's quite an issue, right? Because these astronauts have never seen this before, and they don't know how to react to it. And it delays their other actions, which is even or just as critical. So to understand what this actually is, we have to understand how the Apollo guidance computer works internally. So it has a bunch of writable memory, which it calls core sets. And each core set has 12 different words of memory. In the Apollo system, a word is 16 bits, which is 15 data bits and one parity bit. And each core set can hold one job at a time. So each job has a priority number, like so. And when a new job comes along, it also has a priority number. There is a process that is always running in the background called the executive. And it's kind of like the main thread. It keeps everything else organized and determines when to start new jobs. And when a new job comes along, it calls a function called next core, which finds the next available core set and then loads that new job into the core set so that it can be processed. And then the executive says, OK, is my new job a higher priority than the job that was already running? And if so, we're going to switch focus to that new job instead. And then once it's done, go back to the old one. Right? A single core system that can only do one thing at a time, but is able to switch between them. It's a real-time operating system. Now, a 1202 is what happens when the next core function can't find an empty core. They're all full. And there's nowhere available for it to put the new job. This is never supposed to happen, according to the developers. Uh, they exhaustively tested all the different conditions and all the different things that could be happening at once and determined with absolute certainty that you would never have more jobs going at once than you have cores in the system. So this should never happen, which is why they never saw it during training. We can actually see the code that through this error. Uh, this is pretty neat. It's from a, a project called Virtual AGC, Virtual Apollo Guidance Computer. And they took the code out of the written code books and loaded it on GitHub and built an emulator where you can actually run these different programs. So it's kind of neat to play around with if you have the time. But we can see that what this thing does is if it fails to find a core, it runs this bailout function, which resets some things. And then it loads this 1202 error code into, into a memory uh, that gets displayed on the display and keyboard unit so the astronauts can see that error code. How did this happen? How did this impossible situation occur? Well, we have this cool device called a rendezvous radar, which is used to track the position of the command module so that the uh, lunar module can return to it, like can find it and rendezvous with it in orbit. This thing has 
what's called an angle resolver, which is what controls it and measures its current position uh, in terms of angle of, of slew. And there's a coupling data unit, which takes the uh, current angle and the desired angle, computes the difference, and if there is a difference, it sends a command into the computer saying, adjust the radar by this many degrees. But the problem here was actually a hardware glitch, where two of the power supplies to these things were out of phase. And it just so happened that the time they turned the power on of one of them was exactly out of phase with the other. And it caused this, this thing to constantly think that the uh, antenna was in a position that it shouldn't be in. So 6,400 times per second, it was sending a command into the computer saying, adjust the radar, adjust the radar. And this was causing this buffer, or all these core sets, to be completely overloaded. And so when a new job came in, it said, can't find the core, throw the error and reset. But the reason that it succeeded and didn't throw this critical mission into failure is because when it reset, the computer had this process that would drop the lowest priority jobs out of core sets and free a couple of core sets, which allows new jobs to be loaded. And it, it removed enough jobs out of the cores that it could um, keep processing the important jobs before it reset again. And over time, it had to reset five different times for this to be dealt with. But the key thing is here, the process prior prioritization. Because if they had not been able to prioritize those different jobs and drop the least important in order to keep the most important ones running, that flight definitely would have ended in failure. And that's a lesson that we can take forward into our own programs as well. If you've ever wondered what this PR column here is, if you're not already familiar, that's priority. And this talks about the priority of that process. And we can see a bunch of different values. RT stands for real time, in case you're curious. Um, but this gives us hope, right? Linux already does this. It prioritizes the different processes to make sure that the most important things get the most resources and don't get interrupted. But how do we actually do this in our own programs? If we're not running a bunch of different processes, instead I have several different threads in my program that have different levels of priority, how do I do that? And you can see this issue with some basic C++ code here. Um, this is just a simple function that is burning a bunch of cycles. It's not sleeping the thread. It's actually just looping. And um, we are spawning two of these at once. And we can see that this does kind of what we expect. Because these threads are given the same priority, it does a time sharing arrangement where it does some of thread one and then thread two and back and forth. And they end at roughly the same time. But what if foo is more important to us? I don't want a bar. I have a bar out there. I want foo. So we can actually do that fairly simply by setting the priority of the thread. And if we run this again, and note that this demo only works if you're emulating a single core machine by doing CPU affiliation or actually using a single core machine. Because if you have multiple cores, it can run both at once without blocking either of them. But you get this. And it does all of foo first, and then it does all of bar, as expected. And this is something that in many years I've, I've very rarely seen in code. Um, I have, it is not common to prioritize threads in this way. But it's a very powerful tool that um, I encourage you to look into if you haven't done it before. The other important lesson here is about persistence. And for anyone here who's done uh, embedded code, if anyone here has, I want you to think, how many of you, if you rebooted your system, would the memory come back like this? And how many of you would the memory come back like this? Right, this persistence of data in a volatile memory is actually an extremely rare thing to find in a lot of systems. And we have different workarounds, right? We dump it to EEPROM and load it when it restarts or something like that. But that assumes that you have the knowledge in advance that it's going to restart, and you can dump it and then reload it, um, and that you have enough time to do that kind of work. So this ability to have uh, a memory that persists over time, or any kind of important data that persists, was a critical feature of this flight, or of this computer, that allowed that flight to succeed. So lesson three is persist your important data. And I can show you what happens if you don't. So this is Ariane 5 flight 501, the first flight of the new Ariane 5 rocket in uh, 1996. Partway into flight, it decides to take a hard right and uh, doesn't go so well. It explodes. There's no one on board this, don't worry. Just a demo mission with a satellite, an expensive satellite, but just a satellite. And it showers pieces of rocket all over the ground below. Now, this was the pride and joy of the European Space Agency. It was their brand new rocket they were very proud of. And that was not a great failure to have on a first launch. So they investigated what happened. Well, it turns out they copied a little bit of code from the Ariane 4 computers into the Ariane 5 system. And their code did something a little like this. They took a 64-bit floating value and converted it to a 16-bit signed integer. 
Now, in the Ariane 4, that worked fine, because the value was never high enough that it would cause an issue. But in the Ariane 5, it didn't go so well. Uh, there was an overflow, and that conversion led to a hardware exception. And that hardware exception caused the computer to shut itself down. So this is obviously a big bug that shouldn't happen. Uh, and this is not the exact code. This is my rough approximation of the code that caused the problem. But the real issue, at least according to the inquiry board, is that it was the, it, it was the, the computer could not reset itself. The way the system was designed is they had two different computers. And if one had this kind of hardware exception, it would shut itself down and transfer control to the backup. The problem here was that the backup was the same computer with the same code through the same error, and it also crashed. And Rocket blows up. But what they said was that the reason that it failed, if you had been able to restart it, it would have been fine. But a restart wasn't feasible because it was too difficult to recalculate all the data on a reboot because they could not persist that important attitude data. And therefore, their guidance system failed entirely. Had they been able to persist that data and do a reboot without, crashing, uh, without losing that data, it probably would have been fine. For our next one, we're going to go back in time a little bit. Gemini 8. March 16, 1966. Now, as I mentioned, the Gemini missions were designed to practice certain skills that were going to be used in the Apollo program. Gemini 8's mission was to rendezvous two vessels in orbit and to dock them together for the first time. So we have Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott as our pilots for this. A little fun side story. My first month at MIT, uh, my advisor at the time was Jeff Hoffman, who was a shuttle, pilot, uh, shuttle astronaut. Um, and he took me out for lunch with Dave Scott here. Uh, who obviously was on the moon a couple times. And during that conversation, they were arguing with each other about which one of them was more of a real astronaut. Uh, Jeff being saying that you have to fly five times in space to be a real astronaut. And Dave saying, well, you have to drive a car on the moon to be a real astronaut. <laughs> that was a good uh, eye-opening experience to that program. So we have the Agena target vehicle, which is what they're trying to dock with. It launches first, and an hour and 41 minutes later, Gemini 8 launches right behind it, and then they rendezvous in orbit. And that goes pretty well. Everything going to plan. The view out the window, they can see what they're trying to dock with. And they do that docking. And again, that also goes entirely according to plan. And now they're orbiting together as one vessel. But shortly after docking, they started to experience this weird spinning situation. And this is the Earth flying by, by the way. This gives you an idea of how quickly they're spinning. And this is a bit of a crisis situation, because they have no idea why this is happening. It certainly isn't intended. And they're not adding any control inputs or using any thrusters that would cause this to happen. So they think that the problem is in the Agena vessel that they're docked with, that its flight control computer is using its thrusters to do something that it's not supposed to do. So their response is to separate from Agena, to undock, and to release their capsule so that it's under its own control. Now, note that when they do that, all of a sudden, things start spinning even faster. That is because the problem was not actually on the Agena. It was on their own capsule. And it has what is called the Orbital Attitude and Maneuvering System. And this thing has a bunch of thrusters around that help it orient and turn and move through space. And it turns out <coughs> that one of these thrusters was stuck open and that it was constantly thrusting and moving their spacecraft, even though they were not providing any control input. Now, Neil Armstrong figured that out, and he pulled the circuit breaker to that system, which cut off all the power to it, and it shut down the thrusters. And they were able to use a different thruster system to re-enter, right, to slow themselves down and re-enter. And they ended their mission a lot earlier, and it was considered a failure, uh, but they survived. Right? So they managed to, the human in the loop managed to save the computer system. But this brings us to what I call failure modes, and why they're so important for the systems we build. There's generally four different kinds of failure modes we might talk about. There's fail open, fail closed, fail over, and fail safe. And we're going to talk a little bit about each one of these so we can see how they apply to complex systems. A fail open system is something where if it breaks, if it fails, it will act as if it's not even there. I like a fire sprinkler as a simple example, because if you break that and that vial shatters, that's going to open like the valve isn't even there, even if there's no fire. Fail open system. In software, an example that I see on a regular basis, this is uh, Amazon's Elastic Container Registry. And it's just for storing Docker containers like a Docker registry. And it has a scanning tool where when you upload uh, push images to it, it can scan them for vulnerabilities. And you can set policies that say, if you find vulnerabilities, 
quarantine this container, don't allow it to be deployed so that we don't accidentally introduce uh, vulnerabilities into the system. But what happens when it can't scan it? If you can't find vulnerabilities, you can't quarantine based on vulnerabilities. And this is a situation that actually happens quite often with Amazon because they're notorious for being very delayed in, in supporting modern or updated versions of Alpine and Python and so on. So this is actually a failed open system unless you have it very carefully configured because if that scanning system fails, it will allow you to use that container even if there's a vulnerability that you don't know about. Now, a failed closed system, I like to use the example of air brakes because I actually have an air brake and truck driving license. I'm not an astronaut like the previous guy, but I can drive a truck. Um, so this is how an air brake works. It has an emergency brake that is kept released by air pressure inside. And if the air pressure is lost through a pipe rupturing or a tank rupturing or compressor failing, that air pressure, pressure disappears, the spring activates, and it locks on the brake. That's a fail-closed system, because if it fails, the brake will be applied and the system is shut down. In electronics, we can see this as some, something as simple as a consumer router. If the power supply dies, if you take a hammer to it, if firmware gets corrupted, you're not going to get any internet through it anymore. It has failed in the closed position. Now, fail over, when I searched, I found this beautiful Microsoft TechNet slide that explains it for me. Um, but essentially, you have two systems. If one of them fails, you switch to the other. Very straightforward. Easiest example, backup generators. Right? Your mains power system dies, and you switch to your backup power generators. And it's important to note that your backup system that you fail over to does not have to be identical to your primary system. In this case, it's a completely different source of power. Note that on the Ariane 5 we talked about earlier, their backup system, their failover for the computer, was an identical replica, which meant that it had all the same issues that caused the first one to fail. So in many cases, having your backup system be a different architecture is a preferred design. We can see this getting very complicated in modern cloud architectures. If anyone here has ever worked with Amazon's US East 1 region, you've had to deal with this on a regular basis, because that region goes out several times per year. Uh, but you can build very complicated active, passive, active, active, all sorts of failover architectures, depending on what you're doing. So now we have fail safe. <clears throat> and a fail safe is a bit different, because it's not its own thing. It can actually be a fail open, a fail closed, or a failover system. It's whichever of these makes sense is the fail safe option. And this brings us to the lesson, which is choose the right failure mode for your system. Looking at, uh, and that can be different depending on, on what you're doing. So something like a uh, observability feature or extra feature to your system that's optional and not required, a fail open is generally going to be the safest option because if some metric monitor fails that you don't really need, you don't want it to shut down your entire system. If it manages something dangerous, then you probably want to fail closed, like your brakes. And if it's required for operation, essentially, then a fail over is, is definitely your best bet. Now, looking at Gemini 8, we can ask, what was the failure mode of those thrusters that caused this problem? And things get a little complicated there, because different parts of the same system can have different failure modes. The fuel that is used in these OAMS systems, in orbital thrusters, is what's called a hypergolic fuel, which means that it's two chemicals that, when they touch each other, they spontaneously ignite. Like so. And that's very useful for orbital systems, because you don't want to have to spark and ignite fuel every time you need to do a little burst of thrust in one direction, because you're doing many of those in sequence. So that is what I would call a fail open system, because if your containment system fails, it activates in the open position, and that fuel will ignite. But the valve for it, which is this little solenoid valve down here, it's an electric solenoid valve that requires current to be moving through it to open the valve and allow the fuel through. That's a fail-closed system, because if the current dies, if it doesn't get electricity, then the spring will shut the valve, and the fuel will not flow anymore. But the electrical system that controlled that valve was one that, when it shorted out, it provided constant current to the valve. So even though the valve was fail-closed, the system that powered it was fail-open. And that was one of the key lessons that NASA took away from it, and they changed the design and all the future flights was that if a system should never have electrical power if it's not supposed to be on, so that if there's a short, it doesn't just keep firing indefinitely. So we'll talk about a couple smaller missions here. Well, we're moving past the space race here and kind of into the more modern era, but this is also what I would call the golden age of space flight, because this was one of the most successful missions that NASA has ever launched. 1977, still going strong out there. 
So its objective was to do a flyby of several of the outer planets, and uh, it was designed in the early 1970s with its partner, Voyager 2. And during the first decade of work on that mission, they had thousands of engineers working on it. So in May of 2022, the Voyager 1 spacecraft started sending back erroneous data from its attitude control system. And in order to find a fix for that, the engineers had to go back to records from the 1970s, early 1970s, when these things were being designed, to figure out how it was built, why it was failing, what the software actually was and how it was coded, and try to figure out a solution. <laughs> if, you've ever, you know, if you enjoy like peeling the screen protector off your new monitor or TV, imagine taking it off a $1 billion space probe. But the problem was that the records they were trying to find were not kept where the navigation team was. The navigation team was based at JPL in California, and their records that they were looking for were based in some warehouse. No one was really sure where they were. And not only were they buried in a warehouse, but those records were organized by the name of the engineer who wrote them, not by the, not by the project that they were for. So NASA had to go, and they had to get a list of all the engineers who worked on the project, thousands of them, go and find the boxes for each one, go through all those files to find the Voyager 1 files, and then they realized a bunch of names are missing. And it turns out that a bunch of people who retired between the 1970s and now took their boxes home with them because they had their names on it. It was their property. So they had to go door knocking and find a bunch of people and their descendants to try to find these records in their basements. It was what the project manager called a time-consuming process. <laughs> it took them four months to find those records, assemble them, and figure out and develop a fix for it. Now, fortunately, that fix succeeded. But the lesson here is keep your documentation organized. We talk a lot about how important it is to comment your code and document your APIs and your architectures and all these things. But that's all great, but it's, it's not very helpful if you can't find it and access it easily and search through it when you're in a crisis. Now, Voyager 1 is still out there between the stars and interstellar space, sending us back very interesting data. Uh, but it was a close call. Now, that same probe had another issue uh, this year, which was recovered a lot faster because they had all the documentation available. The last one I want to talk about is the Mars Climate Orbiter, September of 1999. So this was a robotic space probe that was designed to uh, study the Martian climate and the atmosphere and various changes on the surface. And it was also supposed to act as a relay station for probes on the surface. So it was a pretty important piece of equipment. This project was started in 1993, and JPL was the lead center for the programs. So they were in charge of the development. But they subcontracted a bunch of the development work to Lockheed Martin, which is a big defense contractor in the US. So this thing launches fine. It's a cool rocket. It works, it gets into orbit, and it's on its way to Mars. But the issue has to do with the design of the spacecraft. Now, we can note that on the left side here, we have a solar panel that is not on the other side. So we have an asymmetrical design. And there's this effect called solar wind in space where particles that are ejected from the sun make contact with the surfaces of the spacecraft and actually apply a force to it, like wind on a sail. And that solar array is acting exactly like a sail. So it's causing this asymmetrical force, which is causing the probe to rotate and to kind of shift and not follow its proper flight plan. Now, this was known in advance that this would happen. So Lockheed Martin was supposed to develop a program called SM Forces that measured that and recorded how strong of an effect it was having and how much of an adjustment had been made to this flight plan. So that software was written by Lockheed, and that software dumped those results, file, that, those results to a file on the flight computer, which was then loaded up by the software that NASA JPL wrote, and it used those results to do uh, correction burns, to make adjustments to its course so that it would come in on the right position on Mars. Turns out it didn't work out quite that way. There was a difference of 4.45 times between the actual value of those changes and the recorded value of those changes according to Lockheed's software. And that is the, the, the incorrect value is what NASA used to calculate the burns that it should make for the adjustment. And so after those burns, their actual trajectory came in at 57 kilometers altitude of, over Mars instead of 226. Unfortunately, 57 kilometers is within the edges of the Martian atmosphere. So that probe either burned up in the atmosphere as it passed behind Mars, or it fried a bunch of the electronics, it died, and it got slingshotted around the other side back into solar orbit, and we never heard from it again. We're not sure exactly what happened to it. Now, that number, 4.45, is interesting. 
because that just happens to be exactly the conversion between Pound's force and Newton's. NASA had specified in all their documents that everything in this space program is supposed to use metric SI units. Lockheed Martin is an American defense contractor that has done the vast majority of its work for the US government. They used Pound's force instead of Newton's and didn't realize that they had not converted properly. Lesson six, check your specs. <laughs> this cost probably, I uh, guess, a billion dollars, probably, uh, the value of that probe, and just gone. I can show you another example of what happens if you do not follow your specifications properly. This is the Proton M launched by Russia in 2013. It's crooked. turns out that one of the technicians had installed a couple sensors in the first stage backwards. And those sensors were very important for controlling its flight path. It had no yaw control, and so it flipped end for end and went pointy for end first into the ground. It's quite amazing that it survived as long as it did given that flight path, but it didn't end well for the rocket. Had that engineer reviewed the specifications and made sure that those sensors were installed in the correct orientation, that rocket would have been fine. So to review the lessons that we've talked about today, one, humans will make mistakes. It doesn't matter how you train them, what equipment you give them, how important they are to the mission, they will screw something up along the way eventually. But humans can also fix things. So if they make a mistake or if your equipment breaks or your computer fails, your software has a bug you didn't find, they can often deal with that. Prioritizing your tasks is critical in mission-critical systems where multiple things are happening at once and some are more important than others. Persisting important data is also very important for that same reason, so that if there's some sort of an unexpected failure, you can recover from it and you don't have to shut down both of your computers and just give up on flying your rocket. Choosing the right failure mode is critical for safety, particularly when people are on board, and making sure that if something fails, it doesn't fail in a position that opens your thruster and causes you to spin and almost black out. Keeping your documentation organized is the only way that your documentation will ever actually be useful. And checking your specs is a pretty important thing to do before you deliver your final product. Just give it a moment to take photos there. Um, and the quote that I want to leave you with is from Jim Lovell. I told you we'd hear from him again. For some time, I thought that Apollo 13 was a failure. I was disappointed that I didn't get to land on the moon. But actually, it turned out to be the best thing that could have happened. And what he's referencing here is that people were getting a little bored and complacent with the space program. Because this is Apollo 13. They'd already landed on the moon twice. What new is there to do? But this incident caused a major shift in the culture and thought of both NASA and the public that, hey, these disasters can actually still happen, and they can be absolutely critical. And the human in the loop and the teamwork that, is, uh, that goes into fixing them is a very important uh, aspect of all system design. And for those of you who were infuriated that I started my lesson number indexing with a 1 instead of indexing a 0, I didn't. Uh, I just skipped the first one. So lesson 0 is learning from your mistakes. Because from incidents like these, from any critical failure you have in the company you work for, you will learn more from those kinds of failures than you will in weeks or months of testing in a safe environment. And you might note that in the opening there where I was talking about how long different companies had taken to develop their space systems, I skipped over SpaceX. And think what you may about their CEO and founder, but those engineering teams have accomplished some absolute incredible feats. And they didn't get there by playing it safe. They got there by blowing up a lot of rockets very quickly in what they called the iterative design process. <laughs> Obviously, you don't want to do that when people are riding on your rockets. But if you're in a safe environment where all you're going to lose is money or maybe a little prestige, a little time, then blowing things up to figure out where the flaws are is an excellent way to make your systems better and more resilient. And with that, I'll thank you for your time. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Also, this is my email here. Feel free to send me an email if you have any questions or want to talk about any of these things, and I'm also on the conference Slack. Any questions?
So the question is, uh, I talked about checking your specs, but in situations where there are multiple potential points of failure or multiple different things that could have saved it from failure, how do you decide what the root cause is and what's the most important thing to fix? Is that correct? Okay. So you're right in that in, in almost all accident investigations, particularly in space and aerospace, uh, there's always multiple causes. And sometimes in a case like the Ariane 5, the real root cause is, well, you, you did a cast of a double to an int 16 and it overflowed and it blew up. That's a root cause. But no, but that is a root cause. But as the report identified, another real root cause is that the system was not resilient to failure. And so there's always multiple causes and multiple ways you could have saved the system. So when I say check your specs, I mean, if you skip over the stupid mistakes, like putting in sensors backwards by having someone double check your work or verifying that it, it's incorrectly, then you can save a lot of things, right? It's, like a, it's an easy win in that sense. But you're right in that the most important thing you can do is to build resilient systems that are fault tolerant, that have backups and redundancies and sometimes humans to recover when the, system, when the automation fails. Yeah. Any others? Okay, great, thank you. <laughs>